this talks about you know, block limits, uh, why they exist, and how we might be able to deal with them. All right, so what's the block limit? All right, before we start with what's the block limit, let's go back to the top. What is a block? When we say block, we generally mean an IPLD block is a bunch of bytes that you can refer to by a CID or, or the multi-hash component of it. Um, the current recommendation running around in the, the IPFS ecosystem is to try and create blocks smaller than one MIB, but like everyone should support transferring blocks less than or equal to two MIB. Uh, Quick question. Yes. It doesn't, it, it's a bit swappy, don't worry about it. This is the number we're going with, okay. it's two. Um, we can talk about that if there's time after. But uh, concretely, this means that like, if you take the SHA-256 of like a 10 megabyte tar file or like you go on GitHub and you see like this cool repo publish the checksum, it, you cannot go just create a CID out of it by putting the magic incantation in front. For those of you not fluent in multi-formats, uh, this is a, a, a raw, a CID that is raw, that is a SHA-256 of 256 bytes, I, you know. Not everyone is fluent. Um, <laughs> with, with, uh, and you will not be able to load the data, because, even though it's content addressed, because, this, because of this block limit problem. So why does it exist? It sucks, but like, why, why would we have them? Um, the short version is like it reduces the risk of DOS attacks in peer-to-peer -peer networks. So we get this cool thing out of content addressing, which is that the self-certifiable nature of it allows us to not really care who we get the data from. It doesn't have to be a trusted entity. But now we're interacting with these trusted entities, and we need to like put limits on how we deal with them, which requires increments. So one of these is requiring incremental verifiability. You know, in particular, if I have a hash of a 100 gigabyte block, right, a checksum of a 100 gigabyte ISO, uh, and I download it from, you know, from Eric, and then you know, it turns out it's the wrong thing. I have now used up my whole data limit, my whole like data limit for my ISP, uh, and paid all the overage charges, and I still don't have my data. And that's very sad. And so we use incremental vi verifiability to make sure like I am getting good data, I'm getting the data that I want. Um, block limits have been sort of a thorn in in the IPFS ecosystem for a while. And so this has also led to a bunch of people thinking of other reasons why block limits exist. And so we're gonna go through those. Um, other reasons people think block limits exist. With smaller blocks, I can have better parallelized downloads. That's true. It is true. Um, but like, why would I enforce that at the protocol layer instead of letting users choose, right? Like, uh, it feels like it would be really weird for the ethos of the people who are like, we want to allow ourselves to make mistakes, to like hard code in a limit that says like, this will be good for your performance. Also, you can't really, you still have this problem with downloading duplicate data, like you can, you can still work with it. Um, there are multiple possibilities for deduplication with smaller blocks uh, compared to larger ones. Again, why would you enforce that, right? That seems like something a user would be able to choose. So even if this is true, like you wouldn't enforce it at the network layer. And similarly, if I need to download a subcomponent, I have want to download the byte range, you know, one megabyte through two megabytes of my hundred gigabyte, you know, zip file. I mean, you could you should have chunked it smaller, but like, why would I make you do that? Right? That's not like our that's not our style. So I mentioned this a little bit, but like, why is having a block limit like real sad? Um, there's all this like all these hashes that already exist, and more that can and will exist. Um, you can find like Ubuntu ISOs that have SHA-256 checksums. I can't go use those. Uh, all the package managers that have hashes to like lock your files in there, um, they're also using hashes. Some of these things, some of the objects they reference are bigger than two megs, then you lose. And now I, you can't be like, it transfers all Go packages or all NPM packages. You can be like, it transfers, I hope, most of them. And that's like very difficult to build systems out of. 
Uh, there are other content address structures that chose bigger ones, Git and BitTorrent. Git chose nothing, but then the BitTorrent ecosystem imposed like a the Git ecosystem imposed like effectively 100 megabytes because of how GitHub operates. Um, and BitTorrent allows for bigger configurable ones. Some people make new structures and they have reasons for making their block limits bigger. Um, Arweave does this. Uh, if you heard Michael's talk uh, yesterday, uh, he referred to taking large, you know, large objects and chucking them in S3 and then using the SHA-256 that comes with S3 URLs. And so this is a new thing that is being built, like very recently, and it too is doing this. So it'd be nice if we could be compatible. But, you know, we can't. Uh, other reasons people don't like block limits, um, which again are, are sort of like not the thing. I feel like this is the thing. Uh, if there were fewer blocks in the universe, there would be fewer CIDs, which would ease, ease pressure on the DHT. Or you could just advertise fewer nodes, like no one's making you do it. I'm sorry if the Kubo APIs kind of make it look that way, but like it's, it's not a protocol thing. You, you don't have to do it. Uh, fewer round trips means like no round trips through BitSwap because I don't have to like walk multiple layers, which I guess is true, but like you could either use a protocol that allows you to give it a root and then get the whole graph instead of BitSwap, or, and also your, your time to first byte probably goes up because you have to download the entire thing and verify it before you like look at any of the bytes. Um, and similarly, this is a good one. People are like, if I had a, you know, if we could have a single block, then like IPFS ad would always give the same answer. And like, that's not true because like you could do SHA-2 or you could do SHA-3 or you could use Blake-2 or you could use Blake-3. And if you think I'm joking, there are multiple IPFS implementations created by one company that will not be named that use different hash functions that do these things in addition to chunking things and all of that. And this complaint is also not really about block limits. It's just about the fact that UNIXFS is flexible as opposed to things like BitTorrent where it's like a, a more fixed structure, right? which you, we could also have chosen to do or, or could choose to do with no thanks. Um, surely, if you, were, if you really cared about this, just trying to push people to use a Merkle tree hash would be smarter than trying to have really big blocks that everyone uses as SHA-2. Um, speaking of those tree hashes, uh, how would using tree hash, if, if tree hashes were everywhere, how would block limits go away? Um, so a tree hash is, basically a, a hash function that is constructed as a, as, a, as a tree, right? You hash the bottom pieces and then you combine those and hash bigger and bigger. And there's a few constructions for how you do this. Uh, and for those of you who've you know, used, are familiar with either you know, BitTorrent files or, or even how, or how UnixFS is you know, balanced chunker works, it's basically the same deal, like maybe a little fancier. Um, and some, some examples for this include like, you know, Blake 3 and Kangaroo 12. There's a whole bunch of them. Uh, unfortunately, the ones that you see the most these days uh, were, were blessed as SHA version X. Uh, and none of those are tree hashes. Um, and use the, the Merkle Damgard construction, which we will get to. So dealing with large, uh, Large hashes, okay, so this is the, the Merkle Damgard construction. Okay, so this is how like SHA-2 and SHA-1 and SHA-3, these are how, this is how they all work internally, which is there is some compressor function, F, and some initialization vector that is you know, determined by the, the lords of the universe. Um, and you take your, you take your blocks, you, you pad them to be the right size, and you basically just go like IV block output next IV block I'll put next IV, block next IV until you get to the end. Okay. So, yeah, so like this, we removed all the message padding. You know, we'll say we only have like nine, you know, we'll say we only have like 10 chunks for now to look at this. So here's, here's a proposal. Uh, what if we try and like break this up? And we say, I'm gonna ask for like, the last chunk of data, C9, and the internal state at that point, IV9, and then I will compute and see if it meets the final hash. And if I do, then I have verifiably downloaded that one chunk of data. 
right? Which is kind of cool. All right, so now I've verifiably downloaded at least part of this thing. How could I do more? Well, I could ask for the, the previous one, number eight, and the internal state at that point, IV8, and compute and see if it matches the one I got before, IV9, and keep going, and keep going until the first one, and see if it matches you know, the, the IV uh, God-given from the universe. So is this safe? Uh, I sort of just messed around with some hash function internals and was like, yeah, sounds good. Um, I think so. So some terminology reminders uh, for uh, hash functions. Um, there is this thing called second preimage resistance. Uh, we, we really want this. If you don't have second preimage resistance, everything is very, very bad. Um, it's, I need, I, you know, given a certain message, I cannot find a second message such that the hashes of the two messages are the same, right? The prototypical bad thing here is like, there is an Ubuntu ISO that exists somewhere with some CID. And like, I can then create one that has malware in it that has the same CID. That's like, that's like disaster town. There's collision resistance, which is bad, but less so um, if you don't have collision resistance, which is that I, need, I can't find a hash of M1 equals M2, and I can make up whatever M1 and M2 are. All right, so the standard example of this is like, I, uh, I give you a message, which is like, I, you know, I give a dean 10 bucks, and then I get you to sign it. And then I make another message that's like, I, gi I give a dean a million dollars that has the same hash. And then when I go and present it to the bank, I give you like the give a dean a million dollars one, right? That's the prototypical example of collision resistance. Um, free start collision resistance is uh, basically a, a subset of this. Uh, you go like a little deeper. It says inside of like our, our little hash function over there, um, I can choose, if I can like make up one of the IVs, I still cannot get up the same result. So instead of just saying I can't get the same, you know, uh, different inputs, same output, it's even if I get to like stop in the middle of the, of the hash computation, um, if, yeah, sort of IV1, block one, uh, does not give me, cannot give me the same thing as IV2, block two, and you get to like vary all of those. Um, breaking this means that like the compressor function is broken. It doesn't mean that the collision resistance, it doesn't mean you've lost the, the prior, you know, uh, properties, which, which are more important, but like, the proofs that everything works are falling apart, and now you're starting to rely on like, eh, I don't think anyone's found an exploit explicitly yet. Um, and so like when, when the free start collisions break, everyone starts being like, we should find a way out of this hash function. Um, from what I can tell, some references there, uh, SHA-256 is not subject to free start collisions, which are the things that we need in order to make this like slice it up in the middle work, right? Because if, if what happens is, is if you don't have if you don't have you know free start collision resistance, I can give you like bogus a bogus C9 that gives you the result that gives you that, and I can give you a bogus C8, and I can sort of keep chasing you back to infinity, and you'll never reach this the you know the God given IV from the universe because then that would imply that you broke that you've had collision, you broke collision resistance, but I could like keep sending you back indefinitely. And like, that would be bad news for the, like the DOS vector business. Uh, SHA-1, oh, SHA-1. Um, so like the compressor is broken. Uh, you may have seen the thing, SHA-1 is shattered, is in shambles, etc. the names of those papers. Um, unfortunately, some of the popular users of SHA-1 have not upgraded their hash functions. Uh, our good friends in, in Gitland uh, have proposed using SHA-2, maybe sometime eventually with no particular date in mind. BitTorrent has BitTorrent v2, which uses SHA-2, but the adoption is still slowly increasing. Better than it used to be, but BitTorrent v1 is still very prevalent. Um, there is a modified compressor, or a modified hash function that is being used by Git that protects against some of the breakages. 
Could it be modified so that it's safe here? Is that thing free start collision resistant? I'm not sure. Have to do more. I have to do some looking and asking some folks. Maybe those are one of you. Um, let me see how much time I have. Yeah, okay, I have a little bit of time, which means I get to talk about this for a little bit. Um, so something sad with all of this business is that you have to go one block at a time all the way back, which is very sad because you can't, you sort of, you know, in like a bit swap world, I can't parallelize requests. I have to sort of walk back linearly. It's like that worst case bit swap case, right? Of I have a deep linear graph. Um, I could use something like, like GraphSync and fetch it all this way. That would be better. I can't parallelize it, so now I have my 100 gigabyte ISO and I have to download it from exactly one peer. And that is real sad. And what happens when I want to resume and all of this business? Um, so it looks a lot familiar to, a, it looks very familiar to a problem that we already know about and kind of care about, which is like people build deep linear graphs and we want to download those things fast because they look like, they look like, you know, the backbones of blockchains or they look like, you know, Git repos and master that goes all the way back to the beginning, right? Um, so, yeah, so this sort of devolves into the same problem as the deeply linear graph. Uh, one thing that I guess is, is an optimization that I should note is like these chunks here are like 64 bytes or something, but like you can take groups of 64 bytes and just group them all together because you're just computing the function going forward. And so you can set those to your limit, like two megabytes, and, and you're sort of off to the races there. Um, so we'll probably be able to talk more about this tomorrow, uh, but TLDR, uh, there is this thing um, that I've been calling out Manifetch, where the idea is basically you ask someone for a manifest of the CIDs or the things that you will need in order to download the data and like some metadata associated with it. So in our case, in the SHA-2 land, it's give me like CIDs of like the two megabyte chunk boundaries or something, and of the two megabyte chunk boundaries and also the like IVs in the middle. And I still have to linearly download it, right? But I can change my model a little bit. I can relax, if I choose to relax my model from Alice cannot send me more than two megabytes of garbage without me noticing, to Alice can send me only X percentage of garbage data compared to the good data that she has sent me without me noticing. You know, half her data has to be good and the other half can be bad. Um, I can get a bunch of performance out of this. I get my I get my big manifest, and then I start asking for blocks, and I get the first block, and now I trust Alice a little bit more, and I get the next block, and I trust her more. Now I'm like, oh well, now I can send out like two in parallel, and four in parallel, and eight in parallel to other nodes in the network, because I'm building trust in Alice and the manifest that she has sent me. Um, and so again, I still get to be protected from abuse. Um, I've relaxed the conditions a little bit, but this allows me to speed things up. And what's pretty cool here is that this is the amount of trust you need, like the X percent here, is a client side choice. So if I'm like, I cannot afford duplicate data, like my, my ISP is like, you know, $80 a, $80 a byte, just I'll take the latency hit. I can do that. And if I'm like, hey, I found a free AWS account with like infinite resources, then you're like, yeah, whatever. Trust everything from the beginning. It's fine. You, you can do that too. Um, and that's kind of like the idea of this, of this proposal. Um, wow, am I really doing good on time? I guess when you practice your talks, they move faster. Um, so, all right, wrap up. Incremental verification is needed to prevent the abuse, which is why we have the block limits. Um, friends don't let friends use Merkle Damgard hashes as checksums for large objects. Just use a Merkle tree. If, if, you, hate, if you hate Blake 3 and you hate Kangaroo 12, then make a new one that uses the same Merkle tree constructions but uses like whatever security parameters you want. 
but like, please stop doing this. Like it works and we can do the mana fetch thing, but like, God, your life is easier if it's already a Merkle tree. Well, I've already used blank two. Um, shot. It's neither. Uh, for those for those in the crowd, that was Dig saying not to use Blake too because it does none of those things for you. Yeah. No comment. No All right. Uh, shall one shall one is kind of broken, which is really sad because there aren't there are like big content address you know content addressable if we would like them to be systems that use shall one, um, and doing this trick might not be safe. Um, I guess something to note here is like, it's worth thinking a little bit about like, what are the ramifications of being wrong here? Right, like, like what if we did this for Shaw one? And turns out like, nope, not, not safe. What happens in our ecosystem, right? So it seems like it's probably something like people either have to build defenses against some of these DOS mechanisms and other sorts of reputation systems to avoid them or they just stop using these SHA-1 hashes, but that's hard because people then might have started building applications that rely on its existence, and then they have to make this choice about like a big tech swap underneath or just being like, yeah, the security stuff's probably fine, which it almost always is until someone wants to cause you a problem, right? And so those are you know, ramifications to think of about being wrong. Um, and then, Downloading a large block backwards uh, has the same properties as downloading linear DAGs, which is something we also care about anyhow. And we have options, which is good. Yeah, let's, let's, let's kill the block limits. They, they get in the way. Thanks. And I have a few minutes to answer questions, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, I will admit a decent amount of ignorance around exactly how and to what extent shell one is broken, but is it, what are the consequences of applying this method? This is sort of your question. Like, what are the consequences of applying this method to SHA-1? And could you simply tune the client-side parameters to like minimize, like to be like less trust, trusting of SHA-1 data? Like also like if it's like if if we're if we're using SHA-1 to target like just a very specific like git, right? Hundred megabyte block. Why, like the naive thing would be like, well, let the user turn the block limit up to 100 if they really want to use Git. Um, it, or maybe it's something like turn it up to 20 and then use the SHA-1 thing for cheaper. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's, that, so for, for those uh, in the crowd, I'm sorry, there's no thing here for you to hear directly. Hannah's question was like, can, I, can we use the SHA-1 thing? Does it matter? Like. What does it matter? Like, how, how does it impact us if it's a little broken? Are there client-side parameters that allow, will allow users' choice here? Um, like, effectively, them setting their own block limits to like 100 megabytes. Um, so, yes and no. Okay, so hey, let's start with the last part. Anything that allows me to set my, if, I, if you allow me to set my own block limits to 100 megabytes, you can do this, but you may start to see like, effectively ecosystem fragmentation. Because then what happens is like, you know, I'm, you know I, I'm one of the Kubo maintainers and I was like, yeah, 100 megabytes sounds good. And Fatal's like, you're a crazy person. More than 10 means like you're, an, you're insane. And so, nope, 10 for me. And that means that some data will be accessible from one client and not another. Which would be nice if we could avoid. Yeah, we have this problem anyway with various things, with codecs and what. Yes, we have some of these problems anyway. We'll likely talk about them both today and the people who do the WebAssembly stuff uh, later this week will probably want to talk about that too. Um, but yeah, that, that's one of the difficulties with the block limits. Now, if it's broken, right? So I was trying to explain this a little bit, but if it's, if it's broken, I think what happens is like the way in which SHA-1 is broken. Can you essentially keep going backwards and do forever? Yeah, basically. So the, the thing about, oh, there you go. Okay, so SHA-1 dies collision resistance. Uh, that's, that's, where, that's where the problem lives. If you have collision resistance, you also have free start collision resistance. And so the problem is you could trace back. But also the original problem they found was a free start collision. So I'm guessing like, like 
Yeah, That's probably like, easier, yes. Yeah, say like 100,000 for like a collision, but like for a free start collision, it's functionally like, yeah, I think it's pretty easy. Yeah. yeah. And so, so the question, yeah, but, but it's a good question of like, how bad is it compared to the trade offs, you know? I mean, you could do some combo where it's like, I do, I will up my block limit to 100 megabytes for uh, things that use, you know, the, the, the streaming thing yeah. so that it, you know, somebody sends you this like SHA 1 thing that goes back to infinity, you stop. It's like, you know, yeah, right. So, right. So, there's like there are some things there where maybe we say, okay, yeah, you're downloading backwards, and then we have some some limits. It's it's tricky because again, you you want to have things that are user. I don't know what to say, tunable or, um, or you don't want to necessarily have things that are user tunable when they're going to break across people, as opposed to like the user tunable part of the manifest business, which is just like, is it slower or faster, as opposed to like, is it a yes or a no? I'm, yeah. Couldn't you go, so you could have a block limit in the sense of limit how, how light the data is that you download for a shadow one. And for example, it's like, you know, that, that could be user configurable. Like how, how comfortable are you with like shadow one blocks? And as long as you, if you are, at the beginning, you should, whatever protocol you use, transmit the size of the thing you're seeing. And so I, as using, you're claiming you have a 100 megabyte SHA thing, you know, that's fine, I will one. It's a fake one, right? But I will download the 100 megabytes. I will not download more because you told me it's 100 megabytes. Even this, this thing goes to infinity and it's not so going to stop there, uh, independent of the hash function. Um, and then at the end, I will hash the whole thing because now I have all the data. So I can definitely do that. And I would also I would always detect that you screwed me. Uh, yeah, well, you will always detect that you screwed me if you're using the modified SHA-1 thing that Git uses. Yes. So, yeah, and I think that's possible. So I don't, I don't know enough about the internals of the SHA-1 thing that Git is using. Like, it may be that that's sufficient to help us out here. I'm not sure. More, more eyes and people familiar re required. Um, it's not necessarily the end of the world if we have like implementation setting limits for things like SHA-1 or if we would decide that we want to set those limits like differently as, as a community. It's just, it's, you know, it's one of these things that like part of the, part of the game that we, we play when we're building with the abstractions in general is trying to find that balance between when we have to when it is beneficial for us to be able to go off and do our own things for a while to explore the space, and when it's important that we share share things as in order to prevent users from being like, I don't understand, I tried it in this one and then in that one and it doesn't, and I don't know what's happening, right? Um, and this is this is a tough one. <laughs> That's why I was hoping to avoid it with uh, with SHA two and SHA three, and maybe we can do SHA one. We'll see. Steve. So just, so just, I was trying to enumerate concretely to pull this off. What are the tasks that would be? What do we need to do? Yeah. We need to get Manifetch implemented. I mean, if you don't do this, it'll still work, just real slow. Okay. Uh, what you need, well, and I guess so. I guess I should clarify. You need the manifest fetching protocol, mm -hmm. and you need one that is configured for SHA two things. Uh, that needs to exist. The, the speed it up thing with like the exponential growth is only required if you want it to go faster, but you still need to do this like, instead of I have, I have CID, I get block, give me block. You need to do, I have manifest, let me like walk them through. There's probably a bunch of, in, in places like, you know, go BitSwap, go Merkle Dag, et cetera, like the things that do the plumbing for that, there is likely a bunch of work here to be done to enable that. The good news is we sort of want to do these things anyway because of like being able to operate with different protocols. Like there's, there's all sorts of ways to download that you may want to like interleave with each other. Um, fun example that, I, or example I think is fun at least, is like if you have a car v2, you have car file, index in front, you can basically query that car file as if it were bit swap because you can go to the index and use that as like a 
find as a, do you have the block? And you look through the index to see if they think they have the block. And then you say get block. And then you go to wherever the index said to get the block from and you get the block. And like, if you have basically a little more plumbing and more configurability into the data fetching process, you get more options here. And some other folks have taken like sprints at this that we can likely learn from and be like, so what went well? What didn't go well? If you want to try doing this. And we have people doing this maybe in multiple languages, which will take their own approaches for how they put this together because the architectures will look a little different. But like at the, at the protocol level, really simple. Like I have a version of this that I prototyped last January by like hacking together a fork bit swap, which when it does the job. Um, the question is just how you, how you plumb it into like the, the larger architecture pieces, but I think those, I think that's good work we want to do anyway. Um, all right, thanks.